Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. In the coming weeks, we're going to be introducing a lot of new players to our story. There will be the Pirates of the Round, like William Kidd or Henry Avery, but there will also be some major geopolitical players. We'll be talking about the rise of the Dutch and English East India companies and how they interact with China and Indonesia and India. And part of me wanted to just jump in feet first and give you the history of the Mughal Empire from start to finish, and, you know, knowing me, I'd start with Alexander the Great's invasion of India. Or maybe I'd take it back to the Proto-Indo-European people of the Eurasian subcontinent, those who would go on to people Greece, Rome, Persia, and India. I would discuss the Indo-European Sanskrit word Hindush and the Indus River from which the Indian people through their contact with the Greek-speaking Alexander, would derive their English-language name. Or I could use a little restraint for once and begin with Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire. But this show's been a little history-heavy lately. I can't even remember the last time we talked about some good old-fashioned piracy. And we're going to need to talk about some of that history eventually, but I'd like to begin with the pirates. I want to explore those ancient empires and trade corporations through the eyes of the pirates. And I just so happen to know exactly the right pirates for the job. This is episode 118, A Poor Meal. It took a Herculean effort for me not to name today's episode Pacific Adventure 2, Electric Boogaloo. See, we're returning to what I kind of consider our primary narrative a story that we left unfinished almost a year ago. The story of the Second Pacific Adventure. The story of pirates like John Cook and Edward Davis, Charles Swan, Francois Groenet, George Dew, Peter Harris, and William Dampier. If you're new to this story, you might want to go back and listen to episodes 61 through 71. But you don't really have to. We're going to do a refresher today, through the eyes of William Dampier. We left him a year ago on the Pacific coast of Mexico, but I want to talk about how he got there and who was with him and why. Dampier was English. He was educated and he chose a seafaring life. This was during the reign of Charles II and, you know, Charles was all about that seafaring life. Dampier sailed on a merchant cruise to Java in Indonesia. That was his first major voyage and he visited the East Indies. On that voyage, he very likely would have visited Cape Town, as well as Madagascar and perhaps even Australia, before making landfall at Java. In 1673, William Dampier joined the Royal Navy, which was all the rage at the time. England was at war with the Netherlands. Dampier served under, although well, well under, James, the Duke of York, and he fought in a number of pitched battles against the naval forces of William III, Prince of Orange. After the war, William Dampier traveled to the West Indies, to the Caribbean, where he worked as a plantation manager in Jamaica, and it's not impossible to imagine him meeting Henry Morgan in a Port Royal tavern. Morgan spent a lot of his time drinking in taverns in those days, and Dampier spent a lot of time listening to old buccaneer stories. But the plantation life was not for Dampier. He left to go cut logwood in the Bay of Campeche in southern Mexico. Logwood cutting was the preferred occupation for out-of-work English privateers, and really they were all out of work ever since the war ended. Dampier met a lot of old buccaneers in the logwood camps, but most importantly he met two men, John Cook and Edward Davis. Cook, Davis, and Dampier are kind of a clique in the buccaneer world of the 1670s and 1680s. They sailed on the first Pacific adventure under Admirals John Coxon and Bartholomew Sharp. That voyage was well documented by three educated Englishmen. Dampier himself wrote extensively about wind patterns and flora and fauna. That's actually his claim to fame, more than being on the fringes of piracy. Dampier was a natural scientist. His findings, especially those about wind patterns, were studied and praised by members of the Royal Society of London. Sir Isaac Newton, for example, read his findings. Dampier's writings, or 
at least excerpts from his writings, were required reading for officers in the Royal British Navy up until the 1970s. Lionel Wafer was another educated Englishman on the voyage, but he would write mostly about the Guna people in the region of Panama called Darien. And then Basil Ringrose wrote the most comprehensive account of the Pacific adventure in general. His was a day-to-day account of the goings-on, and it was actually edited and published later on under the title A Buccaneer's Atlas. And it gave precise details on cities and armies and fortresses, as well as waterways. If you were to go back and listen to those older episodes, you would hear me build a case for a conspiracy. A conspiracy that stretched all the way from the decks of those pirate ships into the highest halls of the Stuart courts of England and Scotland. The conspiracy breaks down something like this. The Spanish Empire was dying. Their naval strength was a mere fraction of what it once had been. Their gold mines in the Americas were drying up, and the silver mines were producing less every year as well. But Charles Stuart of England knew that the real money was in coffee and sugar and tobacco and slaves. England was very interested in picking the carcass of the Spanish Empire. Everyone was interested in picking that carcass, but England was interested in the Pacific coast of South America. They would occasionally send a naval ship or two to explore that coastline, but the Spanish always chased them off, so what would any good king do? I argued, and I stand by this assessment, that the court of King Charles sent three educated men along with John Coxon into the Southern Ocean, They were to explore and document what they found there. Oh, and when I say Southern Ocean, I'm not talking about the actual Antarctic Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean is just what the pirates called the Pacific. And if I say Northern Sea, I'm talking about the Caribbean, not the North Sea in Europe. Those two names are basically relative to the Spanish Main, which is what I will sometimes call Panama. I think the Stuarts very much wanted to establish colonies in both Panama and Peru. But he wasn't having much luck whenever he would send a naval ship to poke their noses in. They were too high profile. So instead, he chose a group of professionals. Men who were experts at sneaking in under the noses of the Spanish and then getting out alive. Some of the most accomplished privateers of the war, who were now, ostensibly, pirates. That's the best way to get the information he needed without A. spending any money, B. risking in one of his big, expensive ships, or C. risking an international incident that could and probably would result in war with Spain. I'm saying that Dampier, Wafer, and Ringrose were all sent along on that first Pacific adventure as incognito agents of the crown. And moving forward, we're going to be working under the assumption that I'm right about that, because I totally am. The only incident about the Pacific Adventure of note, for today's episode at least, is the loss of one of their guides in the Juan Fernandez Islands. The Juan Fernandez Islands are a tiny island chain far out to the west of the coast of South America. They're small, but they contain fresh water and food. They're a necessary stopover for anybody who can't stop at one of the few ports on the coast of South America. The pirates of that first Pacific adventure stopped there, but they were surprised by a Peruvian ship, so they had to depart quickly. One of their guides, a mosquito man, was left behind when they departed. But eventually, the Pacific adventure would split up. Cook, Davis, and Dampier would sail back to Panama, where they would cross the Isthmus and return to the North Sea. There was a bit of drama there in which the French Tortuga pirates would betray them, but the English escaped, and John Cook named the ship that he captured Revenge. However, in the end, William Dampier sailed for Virginia with somewhere between eight and twenty men. Cook and Davis, though, continued to sail on board Revenge and menace the West Indies. They captured wine merchants and the like for several years until they sailed for North America in 1683. You might remember 1683 as the year that Charles II passed the Jamaica Act. 
an act that allowed for the extrajudicial killing of anybody associated with piracy, so a lot of pirates were leaving the waters of the West Indies and sailing up north. William Dampier, well, a couple of notes about him. He actually had a wife back in England named Judith, but at this point William hadn't seen her in over two years. She was living with his brother back in England while William was attempting to earn his fortune in the New World. Now, that's a thing that really did happen, but usually those husbands would go home after the big voyage. You know, even if they intended to return to the West Indies or wherever they were attempting to make their fortune, they would drop off a chest of whatever money they had earned with their wife and hopefully leave her with a son. But that's not what William Dampier did. Instead, he lived with his very close friends on a plantation in Virginia that was owned by a kindly elderly dowager. Am I suggesting that perhaps William Dampier was gay? Yes, I am. Nobody knows for certain, but, you know, probably. But Cook and Davis were up a bit north of his location in Virginia. They were capturing some ships outside of Providence, and if future events are any guide... It's possible that Cook and Davis were receiving orders up there. There are certain New England officials who were in the habit of employing pirates during peacetime. And if Cook and Davis were employed on a voyage of exploration and infiltration on the first Pacific Adventure, I see no reason to believe that they weren't similarly employed here in 1683. The best evidence of that comes from Charles Swan, but more on him in a moment. Cook and Davis appeared in Chesapeake Bay and made their way to the plantation on which Dampier was living with the other buccaneers from their last excursion into the Pacific. They told Dampier that they were planning another adventure into the Pacific and that they wanted Dampier to come along. Their ship, though, the Revenge, wasn't in great shape. It probably wasn't going to make it all the way to the Pacific, so instead of sailing directly south, they crossed the Atlantic over to the east to raid a few Portuguese colonies in Africa. There they liberated a slave ship of 18 guns and transferred the guns from the Revenge to this larger ship. That gave them a ship of 36 guns and a crew of 70, but they took on a number of slaves from the ship they had just stolen. They also kept around 30 women who had been prisoners on board the ship. Now, later on, the pirates would let them go. In fact, not even a lot later on. They would let them go in Brazil near a colony of other freed slaves. However, John Cook named his new vessel Bachelor's Delight. And that does lead to some questions of the treatment that these women received. However, that's all speculation. None of our chroniclers go into that. Around this time, Bachelor's Delight met up with another English ship under the command of a pirate named Eaton. Captain Eaton told Captain Cook that he was following yet another English vessel, a much larger vessel, under the command of Charles Swan. Now, Swan has an interesting history. He sailed under Admiral Henry Morgan back in 1671 when they sailed against Panama. But he was an honest privateer, and he turned into an honest merchant. However, while he was on a stopover in London, Charles Swan met Basil Ringrose in a pub. According to Dampier, Ringrose was broke, despite his famed atlas making the rounds. Swan was planning a voyage into the Southern Ocean, and then he miraculously happened across a Ringrose who would just happen to be a perfect guide. And in case my tone is not sufficient evidence here, I think that whoever may have been pulling the strings behind the curtain contracted Swan to meet with Cook and Davis and Dampier off the coast of South America and introduced Charles Swan to Basil Ringrose for that very purpose. Now, I don't have any solid evidence to back that up, but there is a mountain of circumstantial evidence. Swan miraculously meeting Ringrose, for example, his entire plan to sail for the Pacific in the first place, the fact that he would go on to meet John Cook and Edward Davis there, and 
all of the other pirates that they just happened to meet in the coming months. There was a convergence of many different names coming together here. Plus, and this is the big thing, the ship that Captain Swan was master of, the Signet, was not Swan's vessel. It was owned by a bunch of investors back in London. A lot of those investors were very close to the king. And it was crewed by honest sailors who turned pirate at the very first opportunity. And then Charles Swan started sending letters back to London. And, you know, I'm not really sure how he got those letters off in the first place in the middle of hostile Spanish territory. But those letters were sent to nobles who owned his ship that had those connections to the king. He was begging them to intercede on his behalf with Charles II. You know, basically saying, hey guys, look, my men turned pirate. They'd kill me if I tried to stop them, but I just want to get myself and your ship and all of the profits back to London in one piece. So please tell the king I'm not a pirate. Try to get me that pardon. All of that shows me, you know, since I'm already looking for a lot of evidence to support my own theory here, that Charles Swan was very possibly working for somebody in the English government who was after further information about the Southern Ocean. Some of those rich noble investors had interests in Providence, the very same place that I suspect John Cook and Edward Davis received orders to pick up William Dampier, the educated Englishman, to send them to meet Charles Swan along with Basil Ringrose. These men, who had deep interests in the colonial world, had a couple of years to go over the Buccaneers' atlas and now wanted more information. They were sending these people back for a second look. Near the Cape, The two ships under Captain Eaton and Captain Cook met up with Signet and Captain Swan. They rounded the Cape of South America, at which point they wanted a break. So they stopped at the Juan Fernandez Islands. And when they arrived, they found their old friend. Their mosquito guide from the first Pacific adventure was still there. He was thriving even after two years on an island. He'd made tools and built shelter, and he cultivated grain and fruit and even domesticated a goat. Now, we don't know his real name, unfortunately. The English said that he had no name and called him Will. And I'd just like to rant about some injustice here. The Juan Fernandez Islands were discovered by the explorer Juan Fernandez, after whom they were named, and we can accurately say that he discovered them because it appears that they had never been inhabited by human beings, so all that's fine. But the two main islands in the chain are named Robinson Crusoe Island and Alejandro Selkirk Island. One is named after Alexander Selkirk, who was marooned on Robinson Crusoe Island. The other is named after a fictional character based on Selkirk, who was never marooned anywhere because he was fictional. Will, the otherwise nameless mosquito, gets no recognition at all. And yeah, I get it. The Juan Fernandez get a lot of island tourism because of their remote beauty and because of Robinson Crusoe. It's what they're best known for. A famous novel, one of the most famous novels of all time, is always going to be better known than some random mosquito who lived there for two years, but, you know, throw him a bone... There are a couple of other islands in the chain, tiny islands, but you could name one after Will. Or, I don't know, call it Willahandro Selkirk Island. But that's neither here nor there. Moving on. After their stop at the Juan Fernandez, Signet went ahead to try and trade legitimately. They were intending to head to Lima, where they hoped to engage in business. Bachelor's Delight, alongside Captain Eaton, engaged in a little light piracy. And then they started meeting up with more and more pirates, who just happened to be there for some reason. By the time they reached Panama, they met up with another group of pirates who had crossed the Isthmus. They had a fleet of small barks, but Cook gave them a ship of their own, one of his large Spanish prizes. That group included Francois Groenet and the journalist Ravneau de Lusanne. A few days later, they met up with Peter Harris the Younger, 
Now, I don't think that all of these pirates who suddenly appeared in the Pacific were part of the conspiracy, if there was one. I think actually quite the opposite. I think that if there was a conspiracy involving Captain Swan and Captain Cook, they probably were told not to bring a bunch of random pirates along with them. It was to be a small-scale affair. So they agreed, of course not, we won't bring any pirates with us. We'll just tell a few pirates to meet us on the far side of Panama. This whole voyage was... Well, you know when you watch an old movie from before you were born, maybe ten years before you were born, and you see a bunch of familiar faces in it? You don't know who they are exactly, but you might find yourself saying, Oh, it's that guy. You know, he's the bad guy from that one movie. I think he's a Nazi. This voyage was full of those sort of characters. Lesser-known pirates who barely deserve a mention here, but later on I know I'm going to be saying, and this pirate got his start on the second Pacific adventure alongside William Dampier kind of a lot. There are captains who will become notorious operating in the Red Sea that were regular pirates here on this second Pacific adventure. And we're going to talk a lot more about them at a later date, but... Right now, I want to stick close to William Dampier. The two groups of pirates joined forces to undertake a couple of large-scale raids, most notably on Panama, but then they sort of split up. They were always kind of separate groups. After the raid on Panama, though, due to natural causes, John Cook died. Edward Davis, his second-in-command, took over as captain of Bachelor's Delight. They spent some time in the Gulf of Nicoya, in modern Costa Rica, where they raided Spanish plantations for several months. This is one of the most fertile regions in the world. It had the opportunity to provide whoever owned this chunk of the world with coffee and bananas and pineapples. This is the very same region that the CIA would actively destabilize for generations, they did so to secure sweet, sweet profits for United Fruit and their monopolistic slave regimes there. William Dampier was writing detailed accounts of the weather patterns in the area, as well as troop emplacements and fertility. But I'm sure he wasn't a clandestine agent here. I'm sure this was only to sate his own curiosity. But around this time, the fleet split up once again. Most of the pirates, including Ravno de Luzon and that lot, wanted to cross Nicaragua, via Lake Nicaragua, to return home. It was the fastest way to get back home, but you wouldn't be able to take your ship with you. Davis, on board Bachelor's Delight, instead decided to round Cape Horn and travel back home that way. Dampier, though, left Bachelor's Delight at this time. He joined the crew of Captain Swan because Captain Swan had other ideas. They headed north for the Pacific coast of Mexico. Apparently, they intended to capture some of the valuable ships coming in from Asia. Swan had filled the men's heads with tales of indigo and spices, of cinnamon and nutmeg and cloves. Now, all of this stuff was worth a little bit less than it had been a hundred or so years ago, but they were still worth a lot of money. A good haul of spices and dyes could set the men up in, say, Virginia for life. However, off the coast of Mexico, there was none of that to be found. There were no ships. They couldn't find any ports. There weren't even any cities. Really, all they found there on the coast were a few fishing villages. They even had trouble finding food up there. There were no cattle herds or fruit plantations, just fish and corn. So Dampier tells us that Swan decided to cross the Pacific Ocean and return home via the Indian Ocean, Madagascar, the Cape of Good Hope, and the Atlantic. He's saying that Swan wanted to circumnavigate the globe. You know, just a regular trader, nothing to see here, deciding to sail all the way around the world. Certainly no ulterior motives leading a man to cross a body of water so large that literally all the land on Earth could fit inside of it. But, you know, I want to play devil's advocate here. If Swan was just trying to escape the stain of piracy, he very well might have thought that crossing the Pacific was better than continuing on with the pirates. 
he would be able to trade his goods in Asia and then return to England with more than enough money to please his investors and buy his way out of prison. But Dampier was eager to cross the Pacific too. I think it's equally likely that it was Dampier that talked Swan into this plan in the first place. Because Captain Swan had a hard time convincing his men to undertake the crossing, and he had to know that he would have a hard time doing so. He was asking them to undertake a deadly dangerous task. He was asking them to endure storms and privation, to possibly endure starvation, and even the possibility of madness. But everybody knew that Dampier was educated. They knew he was knowledgeable about wind patterns, and they knew that he'd been to that part of the world before. He assured the men of the signet that the wind would be kind, and then Captain Swan motivated them with tales of the riches of Manila, and the men came to the decision. They would cross the Pacific Ocean. And that catches us up to where we left off with this story almost a year ago. Captain Swan had 150 men under his command. 100 of them were on board Signet, with Charles Swan commanding, including William Dampier. It seems that Dampier might have been made first mate here. At least, he was somebody that both the men and Captain Swan trusted and looked to for answers. The former first mate of Signet, a man named Teat, was given command of a bark carrying 50 men. Together, these two vessels set out on the 31st of March, 1686. And at this point, now that we're back in the main narrative, I would love to go deep into this story, to get into the real nitty-gritty. And we're going to do that? But in the question of crossing the Pacific Ocean, how deep can we really get? I would love to convey the feeling of one of these crossings, as best as I can understand it at least, but really that would be so boring. I mean, that's the overriding sentiment that the men were feeling here. I thought about making a video, maybe. Video an hour, hour and a half long, where, you know, I could eat a bowl of grits. I could drink a glass of water that has sat out in the sun for a couple of days. I could maybe learn to try nautical knots. I could play solitaire, take a nap, stare into the camera, mutter under my breath about how appealing you're looking lately. Fit and healthy, oh, nice and plump, juicy and, and delicious. <clears throat> See, Dampier mostly writes about wind patterns and Italian miles versus Spanish leagues, and, you know, they did make good time on the voyage. Dampier did know what he was talking about. The sails were full for nearly the entire trip, but the men had only eight spoonfuls of corn a day. They started to grow sickly. Dampier, though, says he was feeling better and better with every passing day, just full of vim and vigor. And he talks about the water a lot, too. You know, the men were given a ration of water every day, but one man refused his water. Not every day, but every other day, maybe. However, he still relieved himself every day, and Dampier was perplexed by this. He goes into some detail about a guy that was caught stealing, and every man on board gave him a single lash and did a good job of it, too. But, I mean, that was pretty much their entertainment trying to figure out why this one guy kept peeing and getting to beat one of their friends. That was the entirety of April. And then into May. And the men started to go a little stir-crazy. I mean, right now it's close to the end of May, so think about every meal you have had for the past two months. And then imagine all of those didn't happen. Instead... You got eight spoonfuls of grits. Not even cheesy grits, just plain grits. Imagine everything you did over those two months and then erase all of it. The men were starting to grow a little mutinous. They demanded ten spoonfuls of corn instead of eight. Now they had carefully rationed out their corn, but Swan knew that this was a difficult situation. He conferred with Dampier, who said that ten spoonfuls a day should be enough, but that wasn't certain. 
there were rats on board that they were unable to stop from getting into the corn. Still, Swan took the risk. He upped their rations, which was a good decision. The men were starting to eye him uncomfortably. Luckily for Captain Swan, around the end of May, they happened upon a reef that was teeming with fish. They spent all day catching fish and ate well, but that only lasted for a day or two. Once they set sail, it went back to corn, and then they only had four days' corn left, and then three days' corn left, and then two days left, and the men started to grow a little bit nervous. Swan noticed them looking at one another with a frightening glint in their eyes. Of course, they could eat the rats that were on board, but Dampier knew full well that it was never going to come to that. He knew something else was going to be on the menu long before the rats. But just in time, with two days left before they ran out of corn, Dampier spotted birds on the horizon and a cloud formation that suggested to him land. He didn't say anything quite yet, but he suggested the pilot move in that direction, and he felt a little bit safer for a time. When the lookouts officially spotted land, the men cheered. They celebrated. Swan approached Dampier and clapped him on the shoulder, giving him congratulations. But then he leaned into Dampier and whispered in his ear, Quote, Ah, Dampier, you would have made them but a poor meal. And then Dampier goes on, For I was as lean as the captain was, lusty and fleshy. End quote. Dampier was aware of a conspiracy on board to punish anyone who had suggested this voyage, should it come to that. They intended to eat the captain, and then, if they had still not found land, Dampier himself... They had arrived at Guam on 20th May, 1686, their first sight of land in the Philippines. And yeah, I know that Guam's not in the Philippines, not as we understand them today. And they were really only sort of in the Philippines in the 1680s, but they were part of the Spanish Pacific Island Territory named after Philip II. And now that they are in the Philippines, as they were understood in the 17th century, we're going to have to talk at some length about the East Indies. But rather than just give that to you in an information dump, we're going to do so through the eyes of William Dampier and Charles Swan. Last time, we discussed the Second Pacific Adventure and the pirates John Cook, Edward Davis, Charles Swan, and William Dampier. We covered Swan and Dampier crossing the Pacific Ocean on board their ship Signet. We ended our story when they reached the island of Guam in the East Indies. And the East Indies are going to dominate our story for the next little while. Dampier, in particular, spent a lot of time in the East Indies on this voyage and others. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at the adventures he had there and the local politics in which he got wrapped up. That's a theme we'll see time and time again. And we'll also look at the history of the East Indies from the time of European contact through the lens of three other explorers, Vasco da Gama, Ferdinand Magellan, and Francis Drake. We're not going to be going too deep into any of those stories, If you want more backstory about them, you could always go back and listen to our episodes about Drake, or you could read Over the Edge of the World by Lawrence Burgreen. It's a fantastic read about Magellan. Or I would recommend the Explorers podcast with Matt Breen. It details the lives of a bunch of different explorers throughout history, and they're just starting a series on Francis Drake. And if you want to, you can go back. They did a full run on Ferdinand Magellan. It's an excellent listen. But instead of going deep into their stories, we are going to explore some of the parallels between those explorers' voyages and that of William Dampier. All of that history was well known to Dampier, and it absolutely would have informed many of the decisions he made. This is a big story, 
as big as the Spanish conquest of the Americas easily, and we need to understand at least the outline of that story to understand what's to come. And all of that story begins with Vasco da Gama. This is episode 119, The Spice Must Flow. If we were to look at the ancient classical world throughout its very long history, we would see five major spheres of cultural influence. Sometimes those spheres of influence were expressed as empires and sometimes not, but they exist throughout history nonetheless. To put it very broadly, there was Rome, Greece, Persia, India, and China. There were, of course, many other great spheres of cultural influence in the world, the Tutsi people, the Mayans and Aztecs, but in the classical world, those were the big five. Occasionally, those spheres of influence would overlap or interconnect, but that's generally how they broke down. You know, from time to time, you would get an Alexander or a Xerxes or Caesar or Khan, and they would march into a neighboring territory and connect them, but that never lasted. Alexander's empire broke up after his death, as did Genghis Khan's. Even Rome, which was famed for their roads and communication networks and bureaucracy, they realized that London and Jerusalem could not effectively be governed from a single source. Even when those cultures evolved within their sphere of influence, when Rome went Christian, or when the Byzantines were conquered by the Ottomans, or when Persia converted to Islam, their areas of influence stayed roughly the same. When the Mongols took over parts of China, India, Persia, the Muslim world, and even some of what was once Rome, the cultures there stayed intact. What I'm getting at is that while the culture itself may have changed, those spheres of influence rarely did. Largely, this is due to geographic barriers. You know, those spheres of influence are defined by deserts and mountains and seas. When it's difficult for people to cross borders, cultures won't shift that rapidly. And you'll notice that throughout most of history, Rome and China had very little contact. And not just literally the Roman Empire, but the sphere of influence that was Western Rome, you know, Europe, essentially. I'm talking about, in the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic world. The Eastern Roman Empire, on the other hand, is more of a Greek sphere of influence. But even when the Silk Road was up and running, the Roman world and the Chinese world had very little direct contact. But then we enter into the Age of Sail, and everything changes. New and better ships allowed the Roman world, Roman Catholic Europe, to finally visit India and China with relative ease. And this all goes back to the 1453 fall of Constantinople, the loss of the European access to the Silk Road, and of course the extremely lucrative spice trade. This is the impetus of the Age of Discovery. It's really the jumping off point for our whole story. And mostly throughout our story thus far, we focused on the West. Christopher Columbus, the conquistadors, the Spanish Empire, expansion into the West Indies. But remember the Treaty of Tordesillas, that papal bull that effectively split the world up between Spain and Portugal? Well, essentially it granted Spain the right to colonize the Americas and Portugal the right to colonize Asia. Now, nobody really knew that yet, because they didn't exactly know what was out there, but they both rushed to figure out what the Pope had granted them. And the story of that Portuguese expansion begins with Prince Henry the Navigator. He was among the first European explorers to explore the Atlantic and the coast of Africa. In his wake followed Diogo Cao, who pushed farther down the coast of Africa, almost into the southern Atlantic, but it was the voyage of Bartolomeu Dias in 1488 that finally rounded the southern tip of Africa. And that's actually a lot more complicated than it sounds. The southern Atlantic Ocean, between South America and Africa, has a counterclockwise wind pattern. From the Portuguese settlements in northwest Africa, the winds along the coast blow north. It's difficult to go south. So what Dias had to do here was follow those winds counterclockwise out to the west. He almost but didn't quite make it to Brazil, and then followed those winds south into the southern Antarctic Ocean. Those frigid winds, at the right time of year, blow east to the Cape of Africa. 
Dias named that cape Cabo Tormentas, due to the storms and high winds. But actually, right here, the ship designs are worth noting. The voyages thus far, those of Dias and Henry the Navigator, well, they used mostly, in fact exclusively, Latin-rigged ships, those triangular sails that date back to ancient Rome, hence the name Latin-rigged ships. They had the ability to tack against the wind, which gave great maneuverability, but they lacked in power. And power was necessary for traversing the open ocean, Spain was using square-rigged galleons to take advantage of the Atlantic trade winds to conquer the New World. Square-rigged sails, especially with two or three masts, each with two or three sails, allowed ships to make good time on the open ocean, and Portugal decided to incorporate those into their navy to gain access to Asia. To that end, King Manuel I of Portugal ordered Vasco da Gama to set sail from Lisbon in 1497. His mission was to find India. And, you know, the Portuguese knew India was there. The king had sent spies overland to scout out ports of call and the political climate, but the entire purpose of this voyage was to find the sea route to India. Da Gama made his way south. Following essentially the same route as Bartolomeu Dias, da Gama was a little more efficient, but he used the same wind patterns. He caught the westerlies and made the cape. They passed the furthest point of Bartolomeu Dias on 16th December, 1497. That means that this was officially the longest sea voyage in history. After rounding the cape, they stopped at the island of Madagascar. They took on water, but they found the locals there less than welcoming. These were the ancestors of the people with whom James Misson and Thomas II would have dealings years and years later. Here in the 1490s they were a bit xenophobic, isolationists even. Mostly that was due to a Muslim kingdom on a nearby island that stretched onto the mainland. That was the kingdom of King Musa bin Bik, an Arabian king who was ruling over an African populace there. Now, this king was not associated with the Ottoman Empire, but he did trade with them. He was a bit expansionist, though. He did try to push out into mainland Africa and had tried to make his way over to Madagascar only to be chased off, hence why the locals were not exactly welcoming. Vasco da Gama arrived in Mozambique, in the kingdom of Musa bin Bik, in March 1498. The king was not impressed with these Portuguese traders, though, and he was worldly enough to recognize Roman Catholics. He'd seen them when he was a merchant. He chased da Gama off. You know how Francis Drake is sometimes considered a forerunner of Caribbean piracy? It might be a bit of a stretch to call da Gama a similar forerunner to Red Sea piracy, but it's not totally off base. This voyage under Vasco da Gama turned to piracy. They needed food and supplies, kind of desperately. They wanted to trade for it, but nobody seemed to be willing. Madagascar had turned them away. Musa Bonbik turned them away. And their next port of call, Mombasa, was openly hostile. So they turned to their last option and started capturing ships for the food and water. But they found these ships to be extremely easy prizes. I mean, think about where da Gama was from. Portugal was really close to Africa, and Barbary pirates were a thing. Oruge and his ear Barbarossa were operating at this time, alongside their friend Piri Rais. Now, they weren't famous yet, they were still very young men, but they were operating in the Mediterranean. Actually, they'll come into play a little bit later. But even beyond that, the Portuguese faced rivals from the Ottoman Empire and Spain and Italy and France. Every ship back home had arms on board, but these traders outside of Mombasa did not. At least, they didn't have arms of any consequence on board. They had bows and scimitars, but no guns. The Portuguese here saw just what easy pickings the ships were. Now, I don't want to say that this is the dawn of Red Sea piracy or anything so grandiose, but this is something of a harbinger of things to come. 
However, the next stop of Vasco da Gama was a lot friendlier. They stopped at a city called Melindi, just to the north of Mombasa. Melindi was an independent city-state. The leader of Melindi was a sultan, and many of the people in Melindi were Muslim. But Melindi was on the fringes of the Ethiopian Empire, and the Ethiopians were Christians. The people of Melindi were a lot more open-minded about religion than the people of Mombasa or Mozambique. Now, Vasco da Gama was very interested in the Ethiopian Christians. You know, Ethiopian Christianity dates back all the way to the New Testament. At least, that's what the Bible tells us. But even if that's not literally true, there were Levantine missionaries in the second century that did make it to Ethiopia. That's the basis behind the whole Prester John myth, that Christian king who bedeviled the heathens from the other side of the empire. Da Gama was very interested in all of these potential ramifications, so he established relations with the people of Malindi. It would be a friendly port of call for the Portuguese from here on out. See, Malindi was in conflict with their southern neighbors, and they needed allies in that fight. A bit later on, the Portuguese would set up storehouses there and an embassy, and they traded spices and weapons with them. Melindi and the Ethiopian Empire would send an embassy to Portugal to meet with the king to formalize their agreement. This was all kind of a big deal for Vasco da Gama, but it wasn't his mission. And he was reminded of that fact when a very strange-looking ship carrying odd-looking sailors and fragrant spices arrived in Melindi. Who these sailors were, what they looked like, what religion they followed, where they were from, well, all of that remains up for debate to this day. And it's a stupid debate based on religious propaganda. I don't really care to delve into the politics behind it, but in short... Muslim leaders, a bit later on, would say that they were clearly Muslim sailors. Hindu leaders would say they were clearly Hindu sailors. And honestly, the most likely possibility is that they were Chinese Muslim sailors working for a Hindu ruler. But it really doesn't matter. If you don't have a dog in that fight, what matters is what happens next. Vasco da Gama followed that ship out of Melindi on 24th April. They sailed directly for the primary center of trade in the entire region, the city of Calicut. Now, Calicut is on the western coast of modern-day India, and we shouldn't confuse it with Calcutta. That's on the east coast. Calicut had thrived for centuries as a sort of a trade depot. The trade route worked out like this. Chinese merchants would buy goods in the Spice Islands. Mostly nutmeg, cinnamon, pepper, cloves, ginger, and mace. Then they would transport those spices to Calicut, where they would sell them. Egyptian Mamluk merchants would buy spices in Calicut and transport them up the Red Sea to Cairo. Venetian merchants would buy the spices in Cairo and sell them in Europe. And you can start to see the problem here. You know, black pepper would be bought in Indonesia, sold at a profit in Calicut, and bought again. Then it would be sold, bought, sold, and bought, and by the time it reached European tables, it had been bought four or five times. It was prohibitively expensive. That's the entire point of this voyage that Vasco da Gama was making. He was sailing to India... Well, you know, kind of to prove that it could be done and to map out the coasts and the wind patterns and all of that was important, but the reason he was doing that was to make contact with the ruler of Calicut. He was to ingratiate himself with the ruler, called the Zamorin of Calicut. If he did so, then they could cut out the middlemen, the Egyptian and Venetian middlemen. That would have huge economic ramifications for the people of Portugal, but we need to break down some of the regional politics at play here. The Zamorin of Calicut was a hereditary Hindu position. He was king of several hundred miles of what's called the Malabar coast of India. He ruled over a mostly Hindu populace, but he ruled kind of at the behest of a Muslim merchant class. See, there were a lot of Islamic states in India at the time. 
and all of them were vying for control of India with each other and with the traditional Hindu leaders. The Zamorin of Calicut ruled a good chunk of the Indian coastline, but just inland there was an Islamic state that had him essentially surrounded. And that state was... Well, it wouldn't be strictly accurate to say they were a vassal state of the Egyptian Mamluks, but they were very closely allied to the Egyptian Mamluks with deep ancient ties. And actually that Islamic state provided the navy for Calicut. And both of them, the navy and the neighbor, reported to the Mamluk Sultanate in Egypt. Now the Mamluks were happy to let the Zamorun of Calicut rule, the people of the region, the Hindus, wanted their Hindu leader. The Zamorin was happy to serve because, you know, he got to be king and he got really, really rich in the process. And Venice was happy with the whole arrangement because they had a monopoly on all of the spices of the Orient. And they had for 50 years now, ever since the fall of Constantinople. The reason that Venice had such an interest in controlling the eastern Mediterranean was to keep their trade routes to Egypt and therefore to Asia open. Vasco da Gama was here in Calicut with intentions to undermine all of that. Of course, it didn't work out. The Zamorin, when he heard that there were foreign visitors in his capital, did rush to Calicut to meet the emissaries, but when he saw them he was... disappointed. The gifts that they brought with them were poor compared to what he had in his palace. He asked Agama, why had he come? And Agama replied, quote, in search of Christians and spices, end quote. And there's actually something worth noting here. That whole Prester John myth, they thought that this might be Prester John, or at least that the Hindus might be some strange form of Christian, they realized that they were neither Jewish nor Muslim, but they thought that maybe after centuries of being removed from what they saw as the one true church, they may have developed some strange customs. Of course, the Zamorin was not a Christian, nor was he impressed. His advisors, his Muslim merchant advisors, had received word of Dagama's outrages in the Indian Ocean, and they informed the Zamorin that this man was nothing more than a barbarian and a pirate. The Zamorin dismissed Dagama. However, Dagama did beg one last favor. He wanted to establish a factory in Calicut, and by factory he meant a warehouse. He wanted a center for Portuguese trade. The Zamorin refused him, though. However, he did permit Dagama to trade while he was here. And they did, but then Dagama made a very smart move. On his last day in Calicut, he kidnapped four local merchants and put them aboard his flagship. And that, well, that's basically the end of Vasco da Gama's voyage. I mean, you know, it was only half over in reality. He had to make it back to Lisbon, and he did have a little trouble doing so. The wind patterns in the Indian Ocean are tricky, and they didn't know anything about them yet. But we're going to talk about those later on when they impact the Red Sea Pirates, Vasco da Gama did eventually make it back to Melindi. Now, many of his men had scurvy, so they spent some time there getting better, and the king of Melindi sent an emissary with da Gama. They rounded the cape going the opposite direction, and they returned to Lisbon on 29 August, 1499. Now, at face value, the voyage might have seemed to be a failure. They had lost half the men with which they had left, and they had scuttled half their ships. Vasco da Gama also failed in his primary mission, the mission to establish trade with India. But the king of Portugal, Manuel I, was pleased nonetheless. The news was good. When Vasco da Gama described the troublesome Cabo Tormentas, the king corrected him. It was not a cape of torment, it was a cape of good hope. The king wrote a letter to the other monarchs of Europe that read, quote, we sent Vasco da Gama, our noble servant, on a quest of discovery. They set off to cross the seas and were gone for two years. They entered and sailed the sea to find great cities, buildings, riches, and large settlements. There they found an extensive trade in spices and precious stones from Mecca to Cairo via sailing ships. 
Our discoverers actually saw them and consider them a large, well-equipped fleet. From Cairo, the trade spreads itself all over the world, and we have the following products of it. Cinnamon, cloves, ginger, nutmeg, pepper, and other spices. We also have many fine stones, such as rubies, among others. End quote. King Manuel had many reasons to be pleased. Vasco da Gama did make contact with at least one friendly power in the region, and he had discovered the source of all of the spices in the world. Sort of. This letter was a victory lap. So check this out. King Manuel was allied to Ferdinand and Isabella, the Catholic monarchs of Aragon and Castile, the mother and father of Spain, the forebears of Charles V. But not only was he allied to Ferdinand and Isabella, Manuel I of Portugal married not one, but two of their daughters. When the first one died, they gave him another. They were his mother and father-in-law twice over. This letter was King Manuel's way of saying to his, probably mostly to his mother-in-law, Isabella, Oh, I hear you met some Indian savages, but I met some real Indians, okay? Because I found the sea route to Asia. Na 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 na. Not to mention, even if Vasco da Gama did lose dozens of men in two ships and failed his mission, well, he brought back a lot of spices. Spices that, had they come through the Venetians, would have cost a kingdom. And whatever tone I might have put on Manuel's letter there, the Spanish were very happy about this news. Manuel was a very close ally their son-in-law, and he was about to provide extremely valuable goods for a fraction of the price at which they were currently available. Goods that Ferdinand and Isabella could definitely afford because they were about to strip America of all the gold. A number of powerful German princes were also happy with the news. These were princes who shared a border with Venice and were tired of the Venetian attitude about the spice thing. This was if you were the right people, very good news. The events of the next decade in the Indian Ocean would spell the end of Venetian hegemony, and their battles in the Mediterranean with Ottoman Barbary pirates would nail their coffins shut. So I'm going to kind of rush through the next two decades or so. The very year that da Gama returned to Portugal, Manuel I ordered another armada assembled, and this was a proper armada. Vasco da Gama's voyage is considered the first Portuguese India armada, but it was a small fleet. The second armada, under Admiral Don Pedro Alvarez Cabral, had over 1,500 men and 13 well-armed ships. At least four of the captains in the fleet had already made the trip around the Cape of Good Hope. Two of them had served in da Gama's mission, and the other two were Bartolomeu Dias and his brother Diogo. Diogo had served not only with his brother's 1488 mission, but he was a clerk on board Vasco da Gama's flagship. He'd rounded the Cape four times now. In addition to Portuguese ships, there were three or four ships in the fleet that were supplied and provisioned by Spanish and German nobles who wanted a cut of the action. Cabral, when he sailed south finally stumbled upon Brazil. Now this might have been a secret directive he was given by the king, or maybe not, but they realized that Brazil fell under their control according to the Treaty of Tordesillas, so, you know, that's cool, but they had other business in India. Their fleet had lost six ships by the time they rounded the Cape. They still had an impressive array of firepower, but that was a serious blow. Two of those ships managed to return to Lisbon, but two of them were lost completely. The other two were the ships that belonged to the Dias brothers. They were separated from the fleet by a terrible storm, and it's likely that they were taking a slightly different tack because they had a slightly different mission on the coast of Africa. But Diogo Dias wandered the sea for months. He was completely lost. He fell under siege by Madagascar raiders and then by Red Sea Muslim pirates and only returned to Lisbon a year later with six crewmen left on board. His brother, though, 
Bartolomeu Diaz, the first captain to round the Cape of Good Hope, was never seen again. However, Cabral, the admiral of this fleet, received a warmer welcome in Mozambique than da Gama had. Perhaps this had something to do with the six warships that Cabral had under his command. The admiral also visited Malandi to drop off the emissary that they'd sent on to Lisbon with da Gama. The alliance between Portugal and Malandi was codified and literally set in stone, as in there's a huge stone pillar that's still there. Then this fleet crossed to Calicut. They had a much more impressive display than Vasco da Gama had. They had hundreds of soldiers and warships that were more powerful than anything the Zamorin had in his fleet. Cabral sent messengers ashore to discuss terms for a meeting, which is kind of a power move. But he had an ace up his sleeve here. Those four merchants that Vasco da Gama had kidnapped, well, he brought them along. And he sent them on to the Zamorin as a sign of good faith. He told the Zamorin that he wanted a meeting, but only if the Zamorin was willing to exchange hostages. Now this was in fact a different man than the Zamorin whom da Gama had met, and he agreed. When Don Pedro and the Zamorin of Calicut met, Don Pedro had gifts that far outshined anything that da Gama had brought with him. He had chests of gold and exotic Portuguese art and beautifully illuminated Bibles. Plus, and this is a big thing, he had a personal letter from the king. You know, this is more like it. The Zamorin was willing to negotiate a trade treaty. He gave preferential trade to the Portuguese and even granted them that warehouse in Calicut. Now, the Arabian merchant class in Calicut was incensed, but this was kind of a young buck Zamorin with wild new ideas willing to push the envelope. The Portuguese spent two months buying spices in Calicut, and they did so in huge quantities. They set up their warehouse to serve as... Well, yeah, a warehouse for all of the spices, but also kind of a military base and embassy for the Portuguese in Calicut. Then they dispatched Franciscan friars to maybe convert the people or see exactly what their religion is all about, and the Portuguese began to relax into their new roles as friends of the Zamorin. Now, the Arabian merchants were the real power in Calicut, and the merchants under Cabral, the Portuguese merchants, suspected that they were being shut out of the best deals. Or it's possible that the Portuguese merchants were getting involved in some shady behind-the-scenes politics, but nobody really knows what happened. There was just tension between these two factions. In the end, Pedro Cabral seized an Arab merchant ship and commandeered their goods, but an angry mob of Arab merchants responded. They swarmed the Portuguese warehouse, and as many as 70 Portuguese were killed. And then the mob reclaimed all of their goods that had been paid for by the Portuguese. Cabral waited for a reply from the Zamorin, who was supposed to be his friend, but the Zamorin stayed quiet. And then Admiral Cabral declared war. He captured ten ships in the harbor that belonged to Arabian merchants and took all of their spices. Then he commenced in a day-long bombardment of the city of Calicut. Now Calicut didn't have a fortress. When Cabral was done, the waterfront was in ruins. The Portuguese were forced to leave one man behind, but they wouldn't be able to get ashore to rescue him. In the end, they turned around thumbed their noses at the Zamorin, and sailed back to Lisbon with ships filled to the brim with valuable spices. And we can kind of begin to leave the politics behind here. Cabral did make some alliances on the Indian coast, but they aren't really that important. The third Portuguese armada that would come the next year had a few dealings with them, but much more importantly, the third Portuguese India armada rescued the spy, I mean merchant that had been accidentally left behind, and then they got into a battle with the forces of Calicut. Because of course they did, because the year before, their admiral had bombed Calicut into ruin. 
But King Manuel would send out an armada every year. And, you know, they started to get a lot better at the sailing part of the voyage. They worked out all of the wind patterns and seasonal shifts and... Well, they kept getting into fights. They were at war with Calicut, after all. But despite those fights, they kept walking away with holds full of spices. But it's the seventh Portuguese India armada where things really ramped up. You know, it takes about, oh, I don't know, seven years or so to complete a fleet of 400-ton warships. Eleven of them, to be exact a fleet that was paid for largely with the profits from six other voyages, a fleet that was complete with 2,500 elite Portuguese soldiers, along with ten additional ships and enough sailors to get them all to India, an armada of 21 ships, Portuguese, Spanish, and German, set sail from Lisbon in 1505. This was not a merchant voyage. The goal of this voyage was not to bring home a cargo of spices. This was an armada built for war, and it was commanded by Dom Francisco de Almeida. Spoiler alert, Dom Francisco was the first viceroy of Portuguese India. The armada of Dom Francisco cut a swath of destruction through the sea route to Asia. He guaranteed Portuguese dominance in the region. Now, they left Mozambique alone, because Mozambique had been friendly to them after that first voyage. But Mombasa and the other Islamic strongholds to the south, well, they were obliterated. Malandi, the friendly city, helped in that effort and sent ground forces to occupy whatever was left of those cities. And they expanded into an empire that was essentially a vassal state of Portugal. That kingdom always gave safe harbor to any Portuguese who needed it. And in the near future, they would, briefly, convert to Roman Catholicism. Along with Ethiopia, they controlled most of eastern Africa for some time. But the fleet of Dom Francisco sailed east, across the Indian Ocean. They destroyed a couple of Arabian fleets on the way, and when they arrived, they started building forts in the territory of the Zamorin, now Calicut sent a small navy and a small army to try and oust them, and in one engagement they did kill the admiral's son, but they were never able to get rid of the Portuguese. Dom Francisco vowed revenge for the murder of his son, and he took up his new post as Viceroy of India. The allies that the Portuguese had made in the region, the rivals to the Zamorin, were to the south of Calicut, and the Portuguese built their center of power right at their northern border, so they had friends to the south who could supply them with men and food and such, and they were able to defend themselves against anything that the Zamorin could send at them. By the time the next Portuguese India armada arrived, they were deeply entrenched on the coast of India, and they were so secure that they were actually able to start sending out explorers to explore Southeast Asia. But Dom Francisco was only moderately interested in exploration. His job was war. He incorporated four successive India armadas into his fleet. He built fortresses all around the region. They were not exactly impenetrable, but a very strong military presence now. But then, in 1509, Dom Afonso de Albuquerque arrived to inform Almeida that his tenure as viceroy was up. Now Almeida was unhappy with this news, not exactly because he thought he should be viceroy for life or anything like that, but he had not yet fulfilled his vow for revenge. He wanted Calicut to pay for his son's life. The battle that was building here had been... Well, you know, between 1505 and 1509, there were a ton of battles in the Indian Ocean. There were even a few skirmishes on land. But this had been building for years. And Almeida needed to be involved here. See, this was going to be the glorious culmination of his term as viceroy. This was going to be the battle that proved he was, you know, worthy. Now, the armada that was being assembled was built by the Mamelukes of Egypt. And they had a small navy, but they brought in all of the other forces from their alliance. Those Muslim Indian vassals of the Mamluks, they brought in a navy. 
Whatever forces Calicut had to offer, they brought in as well. And then the Republic of Venice sailed a fleet down the Mediterranean to Alexandria, where they disassembled the fleet. Then they marched it overland and reassembled the fleet in Suez. That shows you just what the Republic of Venice had to lose. This was an impressive force, but, uh... Well, you know how when people talk about World War I, they just love to talk about, you know, the cavalry charge against a line of tanks. They like to talk about the disparity in forces that kind of symbolizes the dawn of a new age. Well, this battle here was a lot like that. The forces of the Mamluks and Calicut, well, they brought the best ships they had to offer, but all they had were bows and scimitars. The Venetians had some guns on board their ships, but not a lot. I mean, thirty years earlier, those bows and scimitars would have been the primary naval force in these waters, but now, well, they were facing brigantines and galleons that were filled with cannon and men that were wielding matchlock muskets. The Mamluk navy didn't stand a chance. This is called the Battle of Dieu, and it's not a particularly interesting naval battle. The forces of the Mamluks and Calicut and Venice lost. Portugal gained a stranglehold on the Indian Ocean, and that stranglehold would last for decades. Dom Afonso would establish a fortress on the island of Gua, and that fortress would serve as the capital of Portuguese India for years, and from Gua the Portuguese expanded deep into Southeast Asia. The Mamluk Sultanate never recovered. In fact, this was kind of their death knell. The Ottoman Empire moved in and took over Egypt, and if you think back to our time with the Barbarossa brothers, you might remember this incident. This was what allowed them to move all the way over into Africa. Piri Rais, a top Ottoman admiral and a close friend of the brothers Barbarossa, was tapped to command the naval forces of Egypt. He was also given instructions to build a fleet in Suez that would command the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean and push these Catholic dogs from their waters. That's going to come into play soon. Calicut never recovered either nor did their Muslim allies in India. Well, Calicut survived, but the Zamorin did not. Portugal took over the entire area that had once belonged to Calicut, until, a few years down the line, a Persian dynasty, descendants of Genghis Khan called the Mughal dynasty, moved in. But perhaps the greatest power that was brought to their knees was Venice. It wasn't the battle that destroyed them, they had plenty of naval strength left, but their monopoly on the spice trade was broken. Their income basically ceased when the Ottoman Empire took over Egypt. Portugal now commanded the global trade in Asian spices, and Manuel I, king of Portugal, grew unfathomably wealthy. He became one of the most powerful kings in the world almost overnight, based entirely on cinnamon and nutmeg and pepper. He was called, to his face, Manuel the Fortunate. Behind his back, though, he was called the Grocer King. And this world that we see in the wake of the Battle of Dieu is a world that's familiar. It sets the stage for the story of piracy in the East Indies. At least, all of the major players are in place. Most of them, at least. Next time, we're going to introduce the last major global player as we continue our look at William Dampier and compare that to the voyage of Ferdinand Magellan. But one final note here. I always hesitate to say who might be my favorite explorer, largely because of the many, many abuses that nearly every explorer of the Age of Discovery took part in. And I mean... Even if one particular explorer were peaceful, their actions led to centuries of brutal colonization. But I like Vasco da Gama. There's just something about his story, which, if you have the opportunity, you should look up. It's an interesting story filled with intrigue and political drama and a lot of ties to Christopher Columbus. I definitely suggest it. But throughout his life, Despite all of the hardships that he faced, and there were many, 
Vasco da Gama always seems to come out on top. He always wins. It's inevitable. It's, it's like he can't help winning. I mean, take his family name, for example. Da Gama means huntsman. It's derived from the Latin word for a huntsman's prey, da Gama. His ancestors, many generations before Vasco da Gama was born, were the huntsmen for the king of Portugal. That's how they got their family name. And whenever I read about da Gama, I'm forced to think about that etymology. I focus on his family name, and I realize that I, and by extension you, dear listener, have lost the game. The Second Coming by W.B. Yeats is among the most influential and well-known poems of the 20th century. It's one of my personal favorites, and I don't think I'm alone in that. If you're familiar with the poem, you'll see allusions pop up in literature and music all over the place. It was written a hundred years ago, in 1919, in the wake of World War I. That war held horrors enough to inspire a poem about the end of the world, but the war was only part of the story. There was the global flu pandemic that held the world in its grip. There was civil war in Russia and Yugoslavia and Estonia. The Soviets were conquering all of Eastern Europe. England was at war in Afghanistan, and there were socialist and anarchist movements in revolt all over the world, in France, Germany, and the U.S., as well as Argentina. Added to all of that, W.B. Yeats was Irish, and in 1919, that means the Irish War of Independence. That war would tear Ireland apart, and all of that, all of that horror was, in one way or another, tied to World War I. All of those tertiary events seemed poised to shatter the fragile post-war peace. So let's look at the opening lines of The Second Coming. Yeats writes, quote, Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. End quote. It's the word gyre that interests me here. And if I slip up and say gyre with a hard G today, let's just move on. But a gyre is a vortex, essentially. I think about spirals, you know, hurricanes and tornadoes are climatic gyres. Crippling depression is an emotional gyre. Metaphorically, the widening gyre in the poem is often interpreted as the worldwide social and political concerns spiraling out of control. You can see why Yeats would write about the end of the world here. And I've been thinking about that poem a lot lately mostly because I've been reading about oceanic wind patterns. And the largest of these, the wind patterns that shape global climate, are called gyres. And I was familiar with the word from the Yeats poem, but I'd never heard it in real use before. But today we're going to be talking about the Pacific gyres. In particular, we'll be talking about three famous Pacific voyages that made use of them. Those of William Dampier, Francis Drake, and Ferdinand Magellan. This is episode 120, a Saturnalia of feasting and lovemaking. In a show about pirates, topics like wind currents can kind of fall by the wayside. They aren't exactly swashbuckling fair, but part of what I want to try to do is to put you in the shoes of the pirates. And it wasn't all rum and sword fights and freedom. I mean, there was rum and sword fights and freedom, but there was also wind patterns. The humdrum day-to-day minutia of sailing life was a real concern for the pirates. Now, I'm not going to be spending a lot of time on any of this, but it matters today. See, we're going to be looking at the similarities between Drake and Magellan and Dampier's crossings, as well as the differences. And I mean, things like the gyres only kind of matter, really, but well, we'll get to that in a minute. Let's begin with Ferdinand Magellan. He was Portuguese by birth, a minor noble son. As a boy, he served as page to the Queen of Portugal. But this was the dawn of the Age of Sail. Social advancement was earned at sea. And Magellan's story really begins almost exactly where we left off last time, in the decisive Battle of Dieu. 
Magellan's first voyage to the East Indies was under that 7th Portuguese India Armada, the Armada of Francisco de Almeida, and Magellan fought in the Battle of Dieu, alongside his cousin, Francisco Serrao. Now, Serrao would go on to lead an expedition eastward to find the Spice Islands. Meanwhile, though, Ferdinand Magellan sailed back home to Portugal. He did so to pitch an idea. Magellan believed that there was still a viable westward route to Asia, and he wanted the permission and money to find it. But King Manuel I of Portugal was not interested. You know, they had a sea route already, so why bother with another one? Magellan, he fell out of favor. He received a few job offers, but they were small-time fare, nothing compared to his ambition. So eventually, the king of Portugal gave him permission to put his idea before King Charles of Spain. Now, King Charles had a vested interest in exploring the boundaries of his American holdings. He wanted very much to know what lay on the other side. I mean, who knows what was out there? Islands made entirely of gold? And, you know, if Marco Polo's writings could be believed, and they couldn't, there were palaces built entirely of solid gold in Eastern Asia, and that might just be on the other side of the Americas. He wanted the opportunity to claim as much of the East Indies as he could before the Portuguese got their hands on all of it. I mean, gold and silver are nice and all, but have you tried nutmeg? What about cinnamon, pepper, and mace? I mean... The spices that the East Indies had to offer were invaluable. Well, not exactly. They were extremely valuable. But it wasn't just the spices. There was silver, and rubies, and gold, and women. Attractive women. Exotic women. Women who could be converted to Catholicism, properly covered up, married to good Spanish men, and have good Catholic babies. Which you know, kind of was a big part of their purpose here. They were trying to spread the Catholic faith around the world. So Magellan convinced King Charles to outfit an armada for the purpose of circumnavigating the globe. Magellan thought Asia was just on the other side of the Americas. You know, maybe China's just a hop, skip, and a jump away from Brazil. They brought more food than they would need for a voyage like that, though, which, you know, was lucky. The voyage consisted of five ships— and the three that were worth noting here were the flagship Trinidad, under Magellan himself, the San Antonio, under Juan de Cartagena, and the Santiago, under another Serral brother, another of Magellan's cousins. And we should also note a Spanish convict named Juan Sebastian Elcano, who signed up for the voyage in hopes of a pardon from the king. Now, the fleet was mostly Spanish, but Magellan and Serrao did bring a number of Portuguese adventurers along on the voyage, and many of the commanders, due to the voyage being organized by Magellan, were Portuguese. Now, Juan de Cartagena was Spanish and third in overall command of the voyage, and all of that matters. The ships were provisioned with wine and tack and livestock and almonds, and a dried jelly that was rich in vitamin C. This would hold off the scurvy that nobody really knew about yet, but not forever. The fleet headed for Brazil and made landfall at Rio de Janeiro. This wasn't Magellan's first stop at Brazil. He had stopped there on his voyage to the East Indies earlier in his career. And some of his crew had been there before, but not everyone. Those that had been there talked up the many charms that they would find in Brazil. And you know, there's practical reasons to stop at the river. The water and food and wood that they took on was a necessity, and the locals were prolific traders that made a good profit in those trades. But, you know, that's for the quartermasters and the captains. The regular sailors were much more interested in the women of Rio de Janeiro. And they actually got amazingly lucky here, the region had been gripped in a drought for two months, but the dry broke and the rain arrived at almost the same moment that Magellan did. Were the Spanish and Portuguese wizards who brought the rain? Were they loved by the gods? Were they extraordinarily lucky men who were sure to father children with similar blessings? I mean, none of that was probably true, but were they going to dissuade the local women from thinking that was the case? 
Absolutely not. Imagine that you're a young man, about 16 to 22. You're unmarried, you're from a deeply religious culture, and you've been on board a ship with only men for about a month now. You're rowing to shore amid a tropical downpour, and all of a sudden you see dozens of women running to shore to frolic in the rain in the surf, and they're not wearing any clothing. When you finally make landfall, these women run out to greet you and wrap their arms around your neck and plant kisses on you. And come nightfall, the local leaders throw an opulent feast for you and your men, and everyone enjoys what Ian Cameron called, quote, a Saturnalia of feasting and lovemaking, end quote. That sounds pretty great, doesn't it? I mean, who doesn't want to travel to Rio for Vestival, to drink exotic drinks, to eat exotic foods, and to sup on exotic snacks? That's precisely why many of the men on this voyage had signed up in the first place. It was the selling point when the crew masters were recruiting. You know, adventure, and money, and women. And, you know, maybe they'll even pay for college. But now... The desires for adventure and women were sated. They'd seen new parts of the world on the other side of the globe, and they even had enough Brazil wood in their holds for them to have a paycheck back home. They could spend that money on drinks while telling all of their friends about the crazy time they had on their semester abroad. A lot of the men were ready to return to Spain, but they couldn't go home. They'd only just begun the voyage. That Atlantic crossing was only a taste of what they had in store here. Many of the men began to grumble, and a few of the Spanish officers started to take note. Juan de Cartagena, the top-ranking Spaniard in the fleet, third in overall command. Well, in the eyes of the Spanish, Cartagena was really in charge. I mean, after all, this was a Spanish fleet outfitted by the King of Spain on a voyage of discovery for Spain and we could speculate all day about clandestine meetings between shadowy power brokers back in Spain and officers on this voyage. We could think about bags of silver from Spanish lords and premeditated coups. But we don't have any proof of any of that. What we know is that shortly after Rio, Cartagena attempted a mutiny. No, that didn't go well. He didn't have the support he expected here, so Cartagena found himself arrested and slapped in the brig. Now, a man of lesser birth, of lesser standing than Juan de Cartagena, probably would have been killed, but you didn't kill a powerful noble like Juan de Cartagena. So the voyage moved on. But as they went further south, conditions grew too cold and too icy to continue, so Magellan chose instead to winter on the coast of South America. Now, a lot has been made about the similarities between the mutiny on this voyage and the <clears throat> mutiny faced by Francis Drake. And any similarities that are there are at best superficial. Both events happened on or around the southern half of South America on the first and second voyages of circumnavigation. But really, that's about it. The mutiny faced by Francis Drake was hardly a mutiny at all, it was a fabricated Machiavellian power move. It was intended to secure his control over the voyage and prove that he would kill anyone who questioned him. Frankly, it was a kind of a boss pirate move. But on the other hand, Magellan faced an organized coup perpetrated by the Spanish leaders in his company to wrest control away from him and the Portuguese. Cartagena had allies among the Spanish officers, and he was spreading discontent among the Spanish crewmen. While they were at anchor, waiting out the winter, a number of Spanish crewmen took control of three of the ships in the fleet, and those three surrounded Magellan's two. Now, they didn't want to attack Magellan's ships. There were innocent men on board, both Portuguese and Spanish. They also didn't want to risk wasting resources that were on board those ships or damaging two of the king's own vessels. Instead, they hoped that Magellan would surrender. Then they could put Cartagena in as the admiral, and Magellan could stay on as captain, and they could continue the voyage in peace. 
But in the night, a pinnace that was on patrol drew too close to one of Magellan's ships. He captured it quietly, subdued the sailors, and dressed his own men in their clothing. Then he sent the patrolling sailors back to one of the mutinous ships where they claimed to have important information about Magellan. They were allowed on board, and once on board they arrested the mutinous officers, stabbed the captain to death, and took control of the ship. Once in command, they raised a certain flag, surreptitiously, that would signal Magellan that they'd taken command without alerting the other mutinous vessels. Magellan maneuvered his two ships into what would have otherwise been a suicidal position. The two ships still under mutinous control didn't know what had happened, though, so they prepared to attack Magellan. But then the ship that had just been taken over opened fire on her former allies. The mutineers in command on the last two vessels knew that they'd been outplayed. They surrendered. They held a trial on shore for all of the mutineers. Two of the captains were drawn and quartered and then their bodies were put on display. Think of the rack, those X-shaped crosses on which bodies were placed for flaying. That's where they were displayed. According to Francis Drake, who would find the gibbets several decades later, some of their bones were still hanging in place there. However, Juan de Cartagena was the ringleader here, but he was still far too well-born to be executed and left to rot on a foreign shore. Instead, he was given a small share of food, he was accompanied by a friendly priest, and the two of them were left alone on an island. Cartagena was never heard from again. The rest of the traitors, the regular crewmen who were behind the mutiny, were pardoned. They were only allowed to go free on the condition that they would not carry any weapons and that they would do the worst of the work. They careened the vessels, they cleaned the bilge, they did all of the jobs that no one else wanted to do. But that's still better than execution. Juan Sebastian Elcano was among the pardoned prisoners. Once it was warm enough to move on, they began the voyage again. Now, the discovery and navigation of the Strait of Magellan was a thrilling, death-defying affair, but we're not going to discuss it in depth here. It took a month of navigation through the route, though. Magellan lost one of his ships en route, probably to a mutiny, as the crew would arrive in Spain some seven months later. Their former captain was in chains, and those men were arrested and put on trial. But on 28th November, 1520, Magellan's fleet emerged into the bosom of the open ocean. This ocean was still called the Southern Ocean, when it was given a name at all. No one had named it yet. At least, you know, no Europeans had given it a name yet and they didn't have really a concept of how big it was. Ferdinand Magellan noted the calm waters and the steady winds. He called them Pacifico. Now this isn't one of those moments where the main character turns to the camera and says with a wink, this truly is a Pacific Ocean. Magellan was just describing the character of the ocean. It was calm and peaceful. It was Pacifico. It wouldn't actually be called the Pacific Ocean for about another 300 years. Instead, the Spanish and Portuguese called it Mar de Magellais, or the Sea of Magellan. The Dutch, English, and French were not going to follow suit, though, especially after the Reformation and the schism that happened in Europe. The convention among their sailors, the mostly Protestant sailors, and thus most of the pirates, including Francis Drake and William Dampier, was to call this the Southern Ocean. It was actually Dampier's voyage through the Strait of Magellan and across the Pacific that took the first steps toward the new name. He recorded wind patterns in the ocean. But it wasn't until the late 18th century that it became clear they needed a distinction between the Southern Ocean and the Antarctic Ocean. It would be stupid to keep calling it the Southern Ocean when there was another ocean further south. So it was renamed the Pacific in honor of Ferdinand Magellan's first arrival there. But Magellan, ignorant of the distance he had to cross, set his heading north-northwest almost immediately after leaving the strait. This proved to be a mistake, a mistake that later Pacific seafarers all knew better than to make. And now we need to return to the discussion of gyres for just a moment. 
The Southern Pacific Gyre is a counterclockwise wind pattern between Australia and South America. The Northern Pacific Gyre is a clockwise wind pattern between Asia and North America. Now both patterns blow west at the equator. There's also a countercurrent at the equator that carries ships to the east, and this creates something of an equatorial oceanic highway. It's how nearly all ships traversed the Pacific Ocean for centuries. It's the single most expeditious route across the ocean, unless you had business elsewhere for some reason. When Francis Drake crossed the Pacific on the second circumnavigation, he sailed north all the way to Oregon, and then he caught the North Pacific Gyre south to the equator. When William Dampier and Charles Swan set out, they departed from Mexico, also to catch the winds south to the equator. Magellan, on the other hand, set sail directly from the Strait of Magellan. Had Magellan known better, he could have sailed north along the coast of South America to catch the current. He would have at the very least given himself access to wood and fresh water. But Magellan didn't know better. Instead, he just sailed through the southern Pacific Ocean for two months. His men began to suffer from hunger and thirst and scurvy. That vitamin C jelly they had ran out fast. Magellan was sailing through what's called Polynesia today, which is an island group in the central Pacific Ocean. The Polynesian Triangle includes three islands that make up sort of the borders of Polynesia. That includes Hawaii, far to the north, Easter Island, or Rapa Nui, to the southeast, and New Zealand to the southwest. And then Polynesia encompasses over 1,000 more small islands, including the Samoan Islands. Polynesia's huge, way bigger than the U.S., but most of these islands are tiny, and they're usually very distant from one another. Magellan missed nearly all of them as he traveled through the South Pacific. But finally, after two months of sailing, around the 1st of February, Magellan caught the equatorial winds that he should have caught far earlier and entered what's called the Micronesian Island Group, to the northwest of Polynesia. Now, Micronesia is a geographic distinction in the Western Pacific, but within the geographical region of Micronesia is the nation of Micronesia, the Federated States of Micronesia. But that nation only makes up a fraction of the Micronesian Islands. Another prominent island chain within Micronesia is called the Marianas Islands. It's close to where the Marianas Trench is located. Now, those are a separate independent nation within Micronesia, except for the largest and southernmost island in the Marianas Islands, the island of Guam. Now, today Guam is a U.S. territory, and that brings up the question of colonialism. You know, names and how they relate to geography are a tricky question here. Many Micronesian islands currently belong to other larger nations, or have in the past at the very least, which makes the naming conventions here problematic on its own. For example, the Marianas Islands are named after Mariana of Austria, a Spanish queen who never set foot on the islands. The Philippines are named after Philip II of Spain, and the original names of both the Marianas Islands and the Philippines have been lost in the mist of 300 years of colonial rule. And once again, the geography is confusing here because what we think of as the Philippines, the modern nation of the Philippines, isn't the same as what the Spanish considered the Philippines. The modern nation of the Philippines is within the formerly Spanish territory once called the Philippines. The Marianas were part of that distinction as well, including Guam. In fact, nearly all of what's called Micronesia today is what was once considered by the Spanish crown the Philippines. So in much the same way that I'll sometimes call the Pacific Ocean the Southern Ocean, because the people who lived during the time our story takes place would have considered it the Southern Ocean, I might occasionally call some of these islands part of the Philippines when they're not part of the modern nation-state of the Philippines. And that includes Guam. It was Guam that the lookouts on Magellan's voyage spotted when they called out Tierra, Tierra. The people of Guam, the Comoro, were not called the Comoro when Magellan arrived. That's another problem of the naming conventions. The Comoro is a Spanish designation that still holds today. It's how the local people identify themselves, but it wasn't when Ferdinand Magellan arrived. See, 
There's this huge variety of cultural diversity in the people of the Pacific Islands. The unifying factors among most of these people is, well, first of all, you've got the shared history of Spanish colonization, but then you've got their linguistic heritage. I mean, there are a ton of different languages spoken in the Pacific Ocean, but they nearly all belong to what's called the Austronesian language family. The Austronesian language family, much like ancient Chinese or ancient Latin, is the progenitor of a ton of modern languages. And before European contact, people who spoke languages belonging to that family stretched all the way from Madagascar in the far, far west to Rapa Nui in the far east to Easter Island. That's more than half of the globe and encompasses both the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And those people traversed those oceans in Latin-rigged ships centuries before Magellan was even born. So when people, especially here in the U.S., when we talk about Pacific Islanders, it's hard to know exactly who they're talking about. Usually that's in reference to Polynesian people who aren't either Hawaiian or Samoan, but it can sometimes include the people of Hawaii, Samoa, the Philippines, Indonesia, and any of a hundred other cultural groups, including the Comoro people of the Marianas Islands. And those ships that these people used to traverse the Pacific and Indian Oceans, well, they were impressive. Magellan's crewmen were certainly impressed with them when the Comoro came out to meet with him. Fine, fine ships. But everything else about the Komoro people was... Well, imagine this situation. Magellan's men were weak and sick with hunger and scurvy. They needed food and fresh water and vital nutrients. They needed them desperately. And then a small fleet of these impressive, Latin-rigged Komoro sailors came out. And, you know, they thought, maybe they're bringing us the food we need. Maybe they're willing to trade. But according to one officer on board the voyage, the Komoro, quote entered the ships and stole whatever they could lay their hands on, including the small boat that was fastened to the poop of the flagship. Those people are poor, but ingenious and very thievish, on account of which we called those three islands Ilas de los Ladrones. End quote. In English, the island of thieves. But were they really thieves? I mean, they did take whatever they wanted without paying for it, but the Comoro people had different notions of property and ownership than the people of Portugal and Spain. This is the kind of conflict we see a lot when indigenous people come into contact with the outside world. Of course, traditional European propriety flew right out the window when half-naked Brazilian women were offering themselves up freely, but when it comes to your stuff, these Europeans were a lot less inclined toward multiculturalism. There was a brief scuffle, but in the end the Comoro fled in the ship's boat. Magellan led a counterattack the following day and reclaimed their property, including the boat. Then he burned down the village, killing at least seven villagers. They moved on west to reach the Philippines, the island group that we would today consider the Philippines, the modern nation of the Philippines, on the 8th of March. They landed at a small, uninhabited island that had water, game, and trees of fresh, ripe fruit. And it might be, in part, that the people who were writing down the events of this voyage knew that those accounts would be read, but the way they wrote about the fruit they found here on this island is even more luscious and loving than how they wrote about the women in Brazil. But it also might be, well, you know, try an experiment for me. I want you to eat nothing but crackers and stale water for three months. And not the good kind of crackers, no olive oil and black pepper. Think month-old off-brand saltines, and then take away the salt. Then, go to the grocery store after two months of nothing but crackers, and buy yourself a single lime. See how fast you eat that lime. See how much you love it. See how sweet it tastes. And, you know, don't actually do that. You'll probably die. A bunch of the crewmen on Magellan's voyage did before they reached the Philippines. And the way they died, well, scurvy was just terrible. But the men who found themselves here to this small, uninhabited island had their pick of all the fresh, delicious, vitamin C-rich fruit they could want. 
All of those old enmities that had blossomed during the mutiny seemed to have fallen by the wayside. These men were survivors together, and here they had a few moments of peace and plenty. But I'd like to look at what they found here in the Philippines from the point of view of another sailor who made the trip and who was similarly unprepared. William Dampier and Charles Swan arrived at Guam 167 years later, in 1686, on board the Signet. Now, Guam was no longer the island of thieves when they arrived. Almost exactly a century before Dampier, the Spanish had showed up to subdue the populace. This wasn't exactly colonization. They weren't setting up colonies, just building forts and harbors. They needed Guam as a sort of a stopover for the Manila galleons. But 18 years before Signet arrived, the Spanish did commence colonization proper. There were a bunch of Spaniards living there. However, these Englishmen were pirates. They'd perfected avoiding the Spanish over many years of a successful career, and they did the same here at Guam. Now, the Englishmen on board the Signet knew all about scurvy. They knew about the causes of it and how to prevent it. Vitamin C deficiency and vitamin C. Actually, it had been Francis Drake's second circumnavigation of the globe that led to much of that knowledge. So the men on board Signet weren't suffering from scurvy. They'd consumed plenty of vitamin C before leaving Central America, and they had enough to make it across the Pacific Ocean, which they did much faster than Magellan. They used that equatorial highway. But they were starving. Remember, the crew of the Signet was plotting to kill and eat Captain Charles Swan shortly before arriving. And partly, that was the hunger. You know, they were down to just a few spoonfuls of corn a day. And partly it was madness, but mostly it was vengeance. The crewmen wanted to take revenge on Captain Swan and on Dampier, as they saw those two responsible for bringing them on this mad voyage. But Swan and Dampier were saved when they arrived on Guam. They beheld the bounty that the island had to offer, very similar to that which the men of Ferdinand Magellan's voyage enjoyed. And Dampier goes on to tell us at length of the many delicious fruits and vegetables that were available there. He talks about coconuts and coconut milk, and then he talks about the broth that the locals made by simmering coconut flesh in a mix of coconut juice, fresh water, and some local spices. They would then add rice and fish and fresh vegetables, and sometimes they would garnish it with a lime or a mango. Honestly, this is starting to make my mouth water. I mean, that sounds delicious, right? Dampier thought so as well. But mostly he's interested in the palm tree and the coconut. He tells the reader of the textile benefits of the palm tree in addition to the nutritional benefits, and he goes into detail about the means of growing them. Then he writes, quote, I have been the longer on this subject to give the reader a particular account of the use and profit of a vegetable which is possibly, of all others, the most generally serviceable to the conveniences as well as necessities of human life. Yet this tree that is of such great use and esteemed so much in the East Indies is scarce regarded in the West Indies, for want of knowledge of the benefit which it may produce, and it is partly for the sake of my countrymen in our American plantations that I have spoken so largely of it. End quote. Now that's sort of true, but I mean, it's not like the people, the native people of the West Indies hadn't figured out that the coconut and the palm tree were great. It was the Spanish conquerors that came in, killed all of the Native Americans, and took their land that didn't realize how useful the coconut was. Which is crazy, because the Spanish knew that coconuts were useful from their time in North Africa. But it's got something to do with that insane colonial attitude, that superiority that they choose to show partly by refusing to eat local foods. But Dampier was more than happy to eat some of those local foods. But then Dampier goes on to tell us about the people of Guam. He was echoing Antonio Pigafetta, a Venetian who was sailing alongside Ferdinand Magellan, when he talked about those ships that the Comoro sailed. He was deeply impressed by them and their seafaring ability. Everyone was always really impressed with these ships, called the Proa. Pigafetta compared the Proa to the Italian gondola, which makes sense, both were long, thin ships that had an identical bow and stern. 
They were built much like a canoe in that neither end was flat. That means that the ship could sail in either direction. You know, which side was the bow and which was the stern would just switch. Later, circumnavigations and men on voyages of discovery would also mention how maneuverable and fast these ships were. The big difference between the proa and, say, a gondola or a canoe is a second hull, parallel to the body of the ship, called the outrigger. When people talk about outrigger canoes, they're talking about a design based on the proa. Dampier writes, quote, The natives are very ingenious beyond any people in making boats, or proas as they are called in the East Indies, and therein they take great delight, end quote. Ingenious beyond any people, Dampier says, and he wasn't wrong here. These were the ships that sailed all the way to Madagascar, all the way to Easter Island, that traversed and explored the Philippines and Indonesia, and honestly, they still are that. They're still commonly used in the Pacific Islands today. They're fast, agile, and versatile ships. In fact, the vessel that currently holds the world record for circumnavigation via sailing power 40 days, is based on the outrigger model. They're amazing ships. The big problem with the ship designs in the classical world, all the way from the Middle East to the Viking world, is that they had trouble tacking against the wind. Turning around was difficult for them. That means that they always had a hard time maneuvering, especially in battle when they needed to move really fast. But these ships could just turn their sail, and all of a sudden, they would be moving with the wind in an opposite direction. They were spectacularly maneuverable ships. But they had one major flaw. They couldn't hold big guns. The Chinese ships that would sometimes sail in from the north, they could hold the big guns. The Japanese ships that would sometimes sail in from the north could hold plenty of big guns. And these ships that arrived with Francis Drake, William Dampier, and Ferdinand Magellan, they all held big guns. And that lack of gunnery would prove to be a problem when armadas of Spanish galleons showed up to conquer the Philippines. But we're not there quite yet. Next time, we're going to finish talking about Ferdinand Magellan, and then we're going to continue on with William Dampier. We're going to look at the major similarity between their voyages and explore the most famous of the three classic blunders. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I'd like to thank everyone for helping to support the show. Everybody who has recommended this show online or in real life, everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon, or those of you who have made donations through the website, and those of you who have given us a rating or a review wherever it is you listen to the show, you all make this show possible. Thank you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. I recently went to go check out the YouTube video of The Old Captain by Brillig, and I saw a bunch of comments that were from you people saying that you were sent there by the Pirate History Podcast, so you all are awesome. However, if you haven't checked them out yet, I certainly suggest you do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G.com.au. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com, or you can get in touch on Twitter, SoundCloud, Reddit, or YouTube. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.